As Jorgen said, my name is Julie Nicholl. I'm a paediatric dietitian in NHS Fife. I'm a prescribing support dietitian. So the paediatric dietetic team work across acute and primary care in Fife. So we get lots of referrals from GPs and health visitors. And many of these referrals are for food allergy and particularly cow's milk protein allergy. But it wasn't really until I took on a prescribing support role in 2015 that I really started to appreciate how difficult it can sometimes be to decide, is it colic reflux or cow's milk protein allergy, or is it some, some of all of them? So when I was asked to speak around this subject today, I thought it might be quite useful to speak around some of the findings that we have found from looking at paediatric nutri nutritional prescribing in primary care over a set period of time. And then to try and answer the question, look a bit about what is colic, remind ourselves what colic reflux and cow's milk protein allergy are and the importance of a good detailed history to decide what they are. Look at the first line management of reflux, how to manage suspected cow's milk protein allergy and particularly mild to moderate non-IgE mediated cow's milk protein allergy. So allergies that present themselves with it um, two hours or more after the ingestion of the cow's milk protein. And then perhaps look at the typical scenarios we might see in primary care. So a little bit background. Um, my background is paediatric dietetics and in 2008, 14, it's gradually increasing hours from part-time working and I was approached by one of my colleagues in adult dietetics to say would you come and do a job share in prescribing support with her because the post that she'd been doing temporary had just been made permanent. I didn't really know much about dietetics and prescribing and I was like oh, this is going to take me out of my comfort zone a bit but she felt there was a great need to look at um, nutritional pediatric prescribing in primary care and actually it's been great to take my clinical role out to um, the practices and meet some of the colleagues that we chat to quite a lot over the phone and things in primary care. So our remit was to review nutritional prescribing, encourage ad adherence to the pathways that were already in place, and in particular for this, the cow's milk protein allergy pathway and formulary. So in 2011, the paediatric dietetic team in Fife had um, produced cow's milk protein allergy pathway and guidance. So it was to ensure that this was getting followed. To try and ensure nutritional prescribing was safe and cost effective. So pilot data from the first four practices reviewed revealed that cow's milk protein allergy unsurprisingly remained the top indication for prescribing paediatric borderline substances. But disappointingly, infants who were commenced on appropriate formulas for suspected cow's milk protein allergy were not always being re-challenged to confirm diagnosis. So in a non-IgE cow's milk protein allergy, we, we would expect, mild to moderate, we'd expect um, to be on formula for four to six weeks and then a re-challenge to confirm the diagnosis. And that was part of our pathway and that wasn't really being done all of the time. So hence, some families missed out on dietetic support and advice. Lactose-free formulas constituted 16% of the total paediatric borderline substances prescribing. Now, this was really surprising, considering la primary lactose intolerance is quite rare and secondary lactose intolerance is usually tran transient. So there was definitely a confusion there between lactose intolerance and cow's milk protein allergy. So as I said, we'd produced guidelines in 2011 and that was really in response to NICE guidelines encouraging um, assessment and management of simple food allergy in primary care. So what next? We were given funding for an additional, an additional day of a paediatric prescribing support dietitian to help review for 18 months to help review paediatric nutritional prescribing further and to provide support and guidance um, where required. 
So data was obtained for the top 30 highest spending GP practices and nutritional prescribing reviews were undertaken in 28 of these. So records of paediatric um, patients on nutritional products were reviewed for appropriateness, um, adherence to Fife's formulary and whether the cow's milk protein allergy pathway was being followed. Now that was quite subjective because we just had access to GP image records and they don't always have health visiting records in them. So, you know, they, there could have been things done with health visitors that we weren't so sure about. But from the notes, um, there was a perception there that many children were not being challenged <laughs> or um, and state remaining on the specialist formulas indefinitely. We liaise with our own paediatric dietetic colleagues regarding known patients who may have needed prescription amendments or prescription volume changes. And we offer dietetic reviews and practices where appropriate and certainly where there were not children were not under paediatric dietetics. So records of 298 patients on paediatric nutritional products were reviewed. Unsurprisingly, 67% of nutritional products prescribed were for cow's milk protein allergy. So it was no surprise our workload was going up and up because um, of cow's milk protein allergy. But the pathway appeared to be being followed in less than half of the patients. The rest of our nutritional referrals can falter in growth. Um, inflammatory bowel disease preterm. Encouragingly, there was 87% adherence to Fife formulary. So the products that we were advising for cow's milk protein allergy were certainly being used. So the outcomes of our reviews, 48% of the children that we reviewed, the, ch the prescriptions were stopped. And that might have been because the, child, the infants were getting older, they could now get, be moved on to an over-the-counter alternative product. It might have been, we came across some cases where children were tolerating cow's milk protein, they'd never seen dietitians, but they were still in, on the specialist milk because it was really hard to get the baby off, because although they taste very unpleasant to us, babies get very used to them. Um, Prescription continued in 31%. There was prescription change in around 16%. So that might be where we needed to change. There's a bit of an echo, wasn't there? Yeah. yeah. Um, there was a prescription change that might be because the infants are getting older and you know when they get to around 10 to 12 months they're taking much less volume of milk but sometimes the prescription is perhaps still for 12 tins a month. So what else did we see? Many infants had several appointments before cow's milk protein allergy was actually suspected. And that really ties in with a recent study from Allergy UK that say, you know, that about 43% of infants um, can, ha can take up to about three months before they're diagnosed with cow's milk protein allergy. And certainly a recent practice that I was in, I looked more at um, how many appointments infants had before cow's milk protein allergy was diagnosed with perhaps feeding issues coming back and forward. A recent practice I was in looking more at how many times infants were coming back and forward, it ranged from about one to five times. Um, a large number, but encouragingly in that allergy UK study, much more infants were getting diagnosed in primary care. In 2012, I think it was about 15%, and 2017, about 32% being diagnosed with cow's milk protein allergy in primary care. There was a large number presenting with reflux and colic type symptoms. Some put on anti-reflux medications at first appointment without appearing to be any mention of feed volumes or positioning advice. Some commenced change anti-reflux medications at the same time as specialist formulas commenced or changed, so then we can't really see what's actually having an effect. And is it sometimes about managing parents' expectations? And yes, certainly we do want to diagnose cow's milk protein allergy appropriately and timely, but sometimes it's about letting families know as well that some degree of reflux is normal. 
and some degree of colic is normal. So I thought we'd just go over um, quickly, just past these scenarios that you might see in primary care, but we'll come back to them and answer them. So typical scenarios, Alex presented by a stress, first time mum at six weeks old, vomiting after and between formula feeds and very unsettled, particularly in the evening. As an adequate weight gain on average two to three soft stools a day and being offered four, four hourly feeds of 150 mils, what next? Is there anything else you would want to know? Is it colic, reflux mm. or cow's milk protein allergy? Lily, 12 weeks old, youngest of three siblings, third visit to GP with vomiting between formula feeds, prolonged colic type pains and constipation. Weight gain's adequate, health visitor happy with feeding. Older siblings have hay fever, mum has hay fever and asthma. What next? Is it colic, reflux or cow's milk protein allergy? Kyle, four months old, second visit to GP with diarrhea, wind and generally unsettled. Whole family had a DNV virus two weeks ago. Vomiting's now not stopped, although the diarrhea and wind's going on. Small drift in weight, but feeding's okay again. What next? Is it colic, reflux, cow's milk protein allergy or something else? So let's look back at what the, the definitions of each one. So colic defined as severe pain in the abdomen caused by wind or obstruction in the intestines and suffered especially by babies. When a baby cries a lot but there's no obvious cause, it's a common problem that should get better on its own. Gastroesophageal reflux, the passive transfer of stomach contents into the esophagus with or without vomiting or regurgitation. But it can be a normal physiological process occurring several times a day in healthy infants, children and adults. Regurgitation is reported in 23 to 40% of all infants in the first year of life. Gastro Gastroesophageal reflux disease though occurs when reflux of gastric contents actually causes troublesome symptoms and or complications. But when does it become troublesome? So symptoms and signs of actual gastroesophageal reflux disease is when there's an increased frequency and intensity um, of regurgitation and or vomiting um, has increased. There's really pronounced irritability. They're irritable most of the time. And this can be with or without back arching. Refusal to feed and pain during feeding or dysphagia. They may or may not have growth faltering. Hematemesis, they may have respiratory symptoms, and sometimes you will get parents coming and saying they're continually sort of wheezy or you're know, having sort of a choking type um, sound, or there may be more extreme apneas or acute life threatening events. Cow's milk protein allergy. So that's an allergy to the milk proteins. Most common food allergy in children less than three years old. And most symptoms prevent before six months of age and most outgrow cow's milk protein allergy by school age and certainly many by age three. Prevalence is around 1.8 to 7.5% of the um, in infancy. It's much less in breastfed infants with about 0.4 to 0.5%. And lactose intolerance is very much um, confused with the non-IG mediated cow's milk allergy as symptoms overlap and there's a general confusion between the lactose um, intolerance and cow's milk protein allergy. So what are the symptoms of mild to moderate non-IG mediated cow's milk protein allergy? So that's an allergy that manifests 2 to 72 hours after ingesting cow's milk protein. And usually they can have several of these symptoms, so irritability, colic, vomiting, food refusal or aversion, diarrhea, constipation, abdominal discomfort. So already we're seeing similarities between that and um, gastroesophageal reflux <coughs> disease. There may be some blood or mucus in stools of an otherwise well infant. 
they may have itching, flushing, just non-specific rashes and persistent atopic dermatitis. And you might just get very stressed parents coming to you saying, you know, can't put them down, um, we're at the end of our tether. Symptoms of mild to moderate Ig mediated cow's milk protein allergy. So that's when they manifest minutes to two hours after ingesting cow's milk protein. So again, some of the GI symptoms might be similar to um, reflux, your colic, abdominal pain, vomiting, diarrhea, irritability. The skin um, symptoms such as itching, perhaps hives, flushing, swelling they could have a bit of rhinitis or conjunctivitis. So history is key. And certainly when assessing for reflux, we would want to have a good idea of feeding history. Have they been breast or formula fed? They're less likely to have reflux um, breastfeeding. What's the volume and frequency of feeds? Positioning. Are they lying quite flat and more likely to have reflux? What's their growth doing? Have we plotted their weight and length on centile charts? Have we access to um, health visitors' records? Urinalysis of history suggested of UTI. So really, uh, sorry, I don't know if you can see that slide very well, but it's just showing uh, babies up to about two months, we wouldn't really be expecting them to be um, feeding any more than around 100 mils at a feed and probably feeding every two to three hourly. But sometimes you'll get in, um, infants presenting with mothers that are feeding them four hourly and up to, you know, eight times bottles because that's what they've been told by um, the other family, especially if they're new mums. So it's really checking that they're not feeding, um, they're feeding frequently and smaller amounts because that's more natural for a baby. So advice for simple gastroesophageal reflux disease. So it's giving parents education and reassuring them that some degree of reflux is normal and some degree of colic in the evening is normal. But practical advice such as holding baby fairly upright during feeds, keeping the teat full of milk to prevent air bubbles, encouraging tummy time if the baby is awake after the feed. So they're not sort of lying flat and encouraging sort of, you know, more the reflux. Elevating the head of the cot by about 30, that's supposed to be 30 degrees. And avoid overfeeding, taking a feed history. Maximum really we're looking at is around 150 milligrams per, uh, millimetres per kilogram per day if the baby is less than six months old. So encouraging smaller, more frequent feeds. If a baby is breastfed and they were still seeing symptoms after that advice, we may then can be considering Gaviscon or using a feed thickener since, such as instant Caribel. It's a bit more difficult in breastfed babies to do that, but you can give a small amount as a gel before and during feeds. And certainly that can be used in bottle fed infants. Um, or you could suggest an over-the-counter pre-thickened formula. Um, but you wouldn't use these in conjunction with an antacid because they both act as you know, um, thickening agents. Sorry, that's maybe not the best of slides for seeing. But really, um, the cornerstone of the diagnosis of cow's milk protein allergy is a good allergy-focused history. And this one really taken from the IMAP guidelines, which have a lot of resources available um, for assessment of cow's milk protein allergy. So a family history of, ask about a family history of atopic disease. Is there any history of eczema, asthma, hay fever in parents or siblings? If there is, and you've got one or more symptoms of what you think is cow's milk protein allergy, it's very likely then to be cow's milk protein allergy. Sources, think about sources of cow's milk protein and how much is being or was ingested. Are they exclusively breastfeeding and the milk's coming through the 
mother's diet? Or is it mixed feeding? And actually the symptoms have started when mum started giving a non bottle feed. Or are they exclusively formula feeding? And you know it's coming through um, from a normal formula milk. What are the presenting symptoms? And if there's more than one or more than one symptom, when did they arise? What was the sequence of the symptoms arising? And when did they first um, present? Timing of onset, when, did the, when do the symptoms present in relation to ingesting the cow's milk protein? Is it within minutes or is it within hours to days? And the duration and severity and frequency? And has it kept happening? Details of any concern with the feeding difficulties or poor growth and details of any changes that they've made and any changes that's made to the symptoms or any other previous management or medication. So that, again, this is a little bit fussy, but it's really talking about the treatment and we're really just concentrating on the mild to moderate non-IG mediated cow's milk allergy, which is what we mainly see. Um, so once we, we see these symptoms in um, infant, symptoms of non-IG mediated co um, cow's milk protein allergy, we would then want to go to, if the baby's formula fed, to an extensively hydrolyzed formula such as your Nutramagens, Aptimal Peptides. <laughs> if mum is exclusively breastfeeding, we would do a trial of a complete cow's milk pro protein-free diet for her and a calcium and vitamin D supplement. So we would try that for four to six weeks and then gradually reintroduce cow's milk protein again to confirm diagnosis. So in cow's milk protein allergy, the babies are allergic to the intact cow's milk protein. So that's the top chain. So in extensively hydrolyzed formulas, which are tolerated by around 90% of more of, with, of children with cow's milk protein allergy, they are broken down to peptide chains. But a small percentage of children need 100% amino acid based formulas. So that is like your Neocate and Pure Aminos. So extensively hydrolyzed formulas, you might have seen, you know, your Althera, Alimentum, Nutramagen 1 and 2, Aptimal Pepti 1 and 2. Um, and really the 1 and 2 is because the 2 is more age appropriate for age 6 months and ov over. And there's two different sizes of the optimal peptide. And then your amino acid formulas. So just to give you a little idea of some of the, the costs, the extensively hydrolyzed formula that 90% or more of infants should be able to tolerate are around £9.10 to £11.21 a tin. Um, so if a baby is on 12 tins, I think when I calculated, it's about 140 pounds approximately um, up to uh, a month. If they're on an amino acid um, based feed, it can range from about 23 pounds to about 29 pounds 50 a tin. And again, they'll be on about 12 tins initially per month. So you're looking more at two to 300 pounds a month. So it is important as well from a cost perspective that, and a clinical perspective that we have baby on the correct formula. So in response to some of our findings and some from to request from GPs in Fife, we produced some supporting material. We already had our cow's milk protein allergy pathway, but GPs asked for guidance that they could give out to families when a, a non-IG cow's milk protein allergy was suspected. Because it can sometimes be difficult if you've had a very fractious baby to then, you know, get better very quickly on a formula and then to think oh, I've now got to give them the formula that was causing the problems. So the leaflet helps to explain why and how to introduce the specialist formula and then how to re-challenge. And we felt there was a gap just really we had information about cow's milk protein allergy but GPs were quite keen to get something about reflux so one of the 
consultant paediatricians did a section on reflux in, in our infant feeding and prescribing guidelines, um, so stepwise guidance for primary care, and there's a section on preterm and lactose free and faltering growth. But there's also lots of other resources, um, milk-free weaning and re-challenging information and milk-free information for older children out there to use. So coming back to the case studies of scenarios that are fairly common um, that we see. So Alex, presented by stress, first time mum at six weeks old, vomiting after and between feeds and very unsettled, particularly in the evening. Um, Adequate weight gain, average two to three soft stools being offered for hourly feeds. Any suggestions? Do you think it's cow's milk protein allergy, reflux, or just colic? Anybody? I'm sure you, many of you will know. Or would you want to know a bit more? Yeah. Yeah, you'd probably want to know if there was any allergic history. Um, just a bit, a bit more about your allergy focused history, when the symptoms are presenting, how um, long after feeds. But we're really sort of looking, there's no allergic history there. The, what are we? Probably reflux. Um, so looking at giving positioning, positioning advice, elevating mattresses and smaller, more frequent feeds. I, sorry, I didn't give a weight, but usually, you know, as I said, babies are 150 mils per kilogram per day or less. And around Alex's age, you'd probably be four to five kilograms. So he was just received an equivalent of 900 mils um, a day. So a four kilogram baby, 150 mils per kilogram per day is approximately 600 mils. So he was getting quite a bit of, or offered quite a bit of overfeeding. So we'd be suggesting smaller, more frequent feeds, maybe not perhaps all the way down to 600, but um, 75 to 100 mils, three hourly and just give reassurance that some normal reflux and colic is, is, well, some reflux and colic can be fairly normal. So Lily, she was the one that's 12 weeks old, youngest of three siblings, quite an experienced mum, um, vomiting between formula feeds, prolonged colic type pains and constipation, weight gain fine, health visitor happy with the feeding, Older siblings have hay fever, mum has hay fever and asthma. What are we thinking this time? I think it reflux, cow's milk protein allergy. Symptoms of both, but there is a, an allergic history there, so it's probably more likely to be a possible non mild to moderate, a possible mild to moderate non IG mediated cow's milk protein allergy. So we'll be thinking of trialing an extensively hydrolyzed formula for four to six weeks. And if symptoms improve, reintroduction of normal formula to confirm to di um, diagnosis and then referral on. Kyle was the one with diarrhea when generally unsettled, whole family had a DNV virus two weeks ago. Vomiting had stopped, but still the diarrhea and wind, small drift in weight, but feeding okay again, hydrated. What next? What do you think? Mm? Yes, good. Yeah, this is one I did come across in primary care in GP phone peds and they'd said um, probably lactose intolerance, but they were put on an extensively hydrolyzed formula. Um, and that is, it, they didn't need that. They just needed a lactose free formula. And in Fife, we are advising parents or most of the time advising parents to go to buy, purchase an over the counter lactose free formula because there's not really too much difference in price between a lactose free formula and a normal formula. So again, there's still confusion there. Um, they don't need extensively hydrolyzed or amino acid formulas for a, a 
transient lactose intolerance. So that's probably as a result of the DNV virus um, that the whole family had had. Um, so in summary, many babies have colic, especially in the evening. Prolonged colic can be a symptom of reflux and cow's milk protein allergy. Some reflux is normal, but reassurance, positioning and feeding advice sometimes may all be that's needed. If treatment for reflux is unsuccessful, consider cow's milk protein allergy. And consider cow's milk protein allergy if there's an allergic family history and symptoms suggest it, but symptoms do co coexist. But the allergy focused history is the cornerstone of diagnosis and makes a, helps us make a inf more informed decision. Thank you.